So John and I were asked to put together a presentation tonight about the ecological crisis and what people can actually do. Because I think one of the things is like, we sort of constantly get bombarded with like doom and gloom ITCC reports that tell us about how human existence is about to come to an end if we don't make huge drastic changes. And you kind of look at it and it's really difficult to see like how I as one person, even if I do the best I can really have an effect on that. And so part of our, part of what we wanted to achieve tonight is to like at least help generate some sort of sense of hope if that's, if that's possible. Like there really is a lot of doom and gloom to go around, but we actually do have a lot of influence as individuals, but then also as a Sangha, and that sort of extends out to the community at large, right? So there are certain things that we can do as individuals or a group that can sort of change our relationship to the world that we live in that actually do radiate out larger than just ourselves. And one of the things I've really enjoyed hearing over the last few weeks when Sensei sort of presents, um, when, when Sensei presents on ecological topics, and you know, we're talking sort of in the abstract about how this relates to Buddhist concepts, one of the things I've really enjoyed hearing is I'll hear people say, yeah, but what can I do, right? Like, yeah, I understand the problem, and like, I understand that it relates to my practice, but it's like, what can I do? Like, where do we go from here? And so our goal was to sort of not do a presentation where we're basically talking at the old Mahasanga about how things need to be done and coming from the place of, uh, I've got it all figured out. So here, just do the things I say and everything will be ironed out and totally fine. We'll save the world in the next 10 years and don't worry about it. Because honestly, like I have a lot to learn and I'm probably, I'm an example. I'm a real mixed bag on how well I do any of those things. <laughs> right. So we wanted to have this be sort of a, a multi-directional discussion. So, a few months ago in the Shingi, there was, uh, in Sensei's meanderings, he gave sort of a report that he had worked on with Koshin about what the, what the center's energy use was like, right? And you might remember, it's been, it's been a little while since you probably read it, but this was part of a pilot program that Buddhist centers around the world are participating in. And we're sort of, this is kind of the test round. Right. So it's probably about five or six centers, I think, was on the list when I got it. And uh, the idea was a multi phase program. The first phase was doing some sort of energy audit of your center, right? And looking at what you could improve. And then part two, which is what we're going to work on tonight, <laughs> was trying to come up with some sort of project, right? Like, I mean, what can we do as a group or with each other's support, right? something moving forward. So for a lot of centers, they have the disadvantage that, you know, they're in a rented space, belongs to somebody else. They might not have a lot of autonomy over how things are run, et cetera. And we're sort of not in that boat, right? Um, I mean, we, we have our own facility and we have a lot of land around that we can do things on. And I mean, we have a lot of freedom about how we do it as long as the as long as the board of directors from the center agrees with it and the members of the Sangha approve. And so we would kind of like to take that, you know, use that opportunity to be able to work together as a group to like, you know, try and come up with something. And this sort of phase two is like kind of planning and coming up with some sort of idea, the next phase being actually implementing this, right? So one of the goals of this program is not just to like encourage individuals to do something, we sort of want to start here and like have the entire group involved, right? The idea is to sort of start spreading uh, maybe a change in attitude to our own community and then into like a community outside, right? And I don't think that we should take the attitude of, you know, okay, so we're just going to get everything, everything done here. And then like after that, we're going to talk to other people, et cetera. Because really like the way most things ever get done is that we constantly help each other and there's a give and take back and forth. I get a new idea from somebody else. Uh, maybe they get an idea from me, although I'm sure that's probably rare. Um, 
but you know, I mean, that's kind of the idea, right? It's, there's, there's like a collaborative aspect. So <clears throat> recently I was, I was thinking about this a little bit and we were kind of saying, well, you know, it's not really that satisfying when you think about just changing individual behaviors because it seems really isolated. But then like, how do you get to the level of thinking about the group? And then like, does that really affect a situation that seems really hopeless? Because I mean, we're often talking about global emissions, right? Which is a problem that seems like it's way out of our control. And interestingly enough, uh, I was reading Buddhism for Today uh, pretty recently, which is, a, it's like sort of a commentary on the Lotus Sutra with kind of a contemporary take, right? And in the description of Ichin and Sanzen, the 3,000 realms in a single thought moment, uh, the author actually, so normally the three, right? You multiply times a thousand to get 3,000 is traditionally the realms of form, the formless realm, and the realms of desire, right? Which are like the lower six realms. But interestingly, he read it a different way. And uh, he saw it as being the world of the individual, which is like the sort of sphere of influence of, you know, us making decisions, doing things ourselves. The second sphere of influence being like the larger community up to the size of a nation, for instance. And the third actually being like the whole world, right? Which I found kind of interesting because that sort of integrated some conversations that John and I were having about like looking at spheres of influence and trying to figure out how we could give people at an individual level a sense of hope about like the larger picture, the global picture. And then I just so happened to find this reading of Ichin and Sansen, which we talk about all the time, where it was it sort of been recalibrated to put things in those terms. So I saw sort of an interesting connection between the two. Because I think Sensei has done a lot of work explaining to us how our practice is related to our relationship with the world at large. Um, as his uh, quote is attributed on the, uh, on the handout, he said pretty recently in one of the discussions that uh, Buddha nature is nature, right? These things aren't necessarily separate. It's really the same thing if we change our attitude about it. So like we kind of prepared, uh, you know, a couple of general examples that we could talk about, but we're also really interested in what all of you are interested in doing, things that you're already doing that you think are good ideas, or, you know, basically like, where do we want to go from here? So it's not just going to be us presenting to you, like, please, by all means, like feel emboldened to like hop in with ideas that you have or things that you're interested in. because like. If we're interested in a project, then it's much easier to actually do it, right? As opposed to just picking something because we think it sounds good and nobody really cares about it. So one of the things we're asking people to think about, and I don't necessarily have to come up with any particular ideas tonight, although if you do, that's fine. What could we all as a Sangha do? But in the meanwhile, we wanted to concentrate on individual efforts with the idea, as Kaiden is saying, that those efforts can ripple out in many different ways. And even though it's true that an individual can only do so much when we have such systemic problems, I don't think we should underestimate that. Because if each one of us takes our little grain of sand and puts it on the right side of the balance, then it makes a huge difference. So we still have to do our part and we have to do it with a sense of fear. <clears throat> I think if you do read the IPCC report, which says that we have to reduce emissions by 43% by 2030, and sometimes it's, I read that they say 50% by 2030. Meanwhile, our greenhouse gas emissions are increasing every year, and that's only seven and a half years from now. It really doesn't seem like this is possible. And, Yet, if we don't reach those uh, markers, you know, they're telling us this is science. This isn't chicken little. This is science telling us that we're in for some catastrophic events. You know, parts of the planet would become uninhabitable with all the attendant refugee crises that that portends. I mean, there was on the news just last night that parts of India are already becoming uninhabitable and it's affecting agriculture and everything else. These are the harbingers of what's to come. I think here in the Northeast, 
where we live, we don't see it as much. We haven't really experienced a drought. Uh, we still have a winter. We tend to think when we get a nice day in winter, hey, yeah, it's great. You know, it's a warm day. And, and yet, there are other parts of the world where these events are already causing tremendous problems. So, as blessed as we might be here to have minimal impacts so far, you know, let's be clear, it's coming. It's already started. And so what can we do? Uh, I know as somebody, as myself, I've been a climate activist for my whole life, really. And there's times when I fall into a sense of despair. Uh, but that's not an appropriate reaction. Because even if things seem overwhelmingly bad, the antidote for despair is action. And there's nothing that's going on now that couldn't be solved. What we have is a lack of political will to solve it. But it could be solved. We do have the technology to get going. We know that we have paths that are open to us that could bring us to a point of stability. But we're not doing it. We're starting. And it's not like nothing's happening but it's just not happening fast enough. Bill McKibben, who was a leader of the environmental movement, one of the founders of 350.org, one of the climate advocacy groups that's been on this for a long, long time, said winning slowly is not winning. Right now we're winning slowly, but you can win a lot faster. So there actually are things that we as individuals can do that can have a pretty profound effect. And one of those, you know, we this handout that we put together with links, and of course, we didn't print out a zillion of them for, for the people who are here in person because it's a lot better if you use the PDF because the links work there. You can just click them. You just click on them. Yeah. But by all means, we'll be happy to give you a printout if you want it. But on this, on this three pages of links, there's all kinds of links to things that you can do. Not that anyone here is going to do all of these things. That would be, you know, beyond what anyone would expect. But, and each one of us has their own individual circumstance. So some things are easier to do than others. Some things are, are things that you can just slide into better. Um, but there, there's a lot of really good information in some of these links. And some of them apply to people who live in Massachusetts or New York, because that's the local sangha. And so we couldn't really present links for every jurisdiction, uh, especially because some of these things relate to tax incentives and things of that sort. But uh, those of you who aren't in the local area, I still encourage you to look at these links and because some of them do will apply to you because they will have information that's useful generally. And also, you know, use them as a template for uh, looking into what incentives are available where you happen to live. But um, one of the things of the, one primary move that we as a society can make would be to electrify as many things as possible because we have renewable energy for the, for we can produce solar, we can produce geothermal energy, we can produce a lot of electric energy from renewable energy, from green energy sources. Well, let's, uh, let's actually uh, go to the next slide really quick. So this chart represents greenhouse gas emissions by like various sectors, right? In this particular chart, electricity has been distributed among them, right? Because electricity production itself is a major source of greenhouse gas emissions across all of these sectors of life, right? Residential and commercial industry, transportation, and agriculture. So like what John's talking about is like, this is something that has very far reaching implications. That's right. And so right away, uh, you can switch energy electrical suppliers. You can go with a green electricity supplier. And we have links here for New York and Mass on that. And basically what that does is in, in these states, what happens is you still get your electric bill from the utility company, just like you always would. But you've signed up with someone who is producing green electricity. And what that means is that all the electricity that you're using, they're buying that electricity someplace on the grid. 
the actual electrons that flow into your house, we can't you know, designate where they came from. But your energy use is being offset by green electricity someplace in that electrical grid that you are a part of. So you are effectively promoting renewable energy when you buy electricity that way. Now, it might add the electricity that I get in Massachusetts where I live, I think I pay another three cents a kilowatt hour or something. Our electricity usage isn't very great at our house because we have solar panels. So I pay maybe an extra $120 a year. <coughs> but that means that all of my electricity, whether it's from our solar panels or anything that we use beyond what our panels produce, is coming from a clean source. And this is putting money into the developers of, green, of renewable energy so that they can bring new projects on board. So it's a really important thing that can be done very easily. All you do is sign up for something. The other thing that I just alluded to is solar panels. Even here in New England, you know, I have a relatively modest solar amount of solar panels, and we produce 90% of our electricity. So, and by the way, we live in Massachusetts, as I said. The payback period for that was just a little over six years with the incentives. We're already in our sixth year. That means that our electricity from here on out is free and the panels have a 25 year warranty on. So we're gonna get 18, 19 years of free electricity. That's a pretty good deal. You can't find investments like that hardly anywhere these days. But say you live in a house where there's, over, there's trees, you don't have a Southern exposure or you don't own your house. You live in an apartment building, whatever. You can join a solar farm. What that means is somebody has built a, 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 an array, a, a commercial array of solar panels, and you purchase what amounts to some fractional amount of whatever the output of those panels are. And that is credited to your account. Now, what happens is you can't really, at least with the company that I went with, we had that before we put our panels up and our electricity use was so low that it didn't make sense to keep doing that. But you will then get a credit for whatever those panels produce and, they, and it rolls over from month to month. So if you don't use that amount of electricity that year, you'll still get the credit for it. And by the way, that power, when I bought it, and I think it's still the case, was sold at 15% below what the utility charges. So again, there's a huge incentive to do this you're buying green electricity, and it's costing you less. So, you know, and you're, you're producing, you're contributing financially to a local solar farm that might not otherwise be built if people like you weren't contributing to it. And when I say local, like in Massachusetts, it's somewhere in the Commonwealth. It doesn't mean it's like in your, you know, in 10 miles or something. I can't see it out the window. So. Yeah. yeah. So, you know. I don't know if you go by the Hancock Shaker villages, all of that old array of solar panels there, that's all a solar farm. So you can find those and you can, you can uh, buy solar electricity that way. The other thing here in the Northeast uh, that we deal with is heating. That's probably one of our major energy uses. And that's a tough one to get off of, but heat pumps have now become very energy efficient. And there's two types of heat pumps, some that, well, well, all of the heat pumps work on a principle like your refrigerator does. It just moves using electricity and a coolant, it moves the heat from one place or takes it out and moves it someplace else. These heat pumps are now so efficient that they can draw heat energy out of zero degree Fahrenheit outside air temperatures. Obviously they're more efficient at a higher temperature, but they can still do that. They can still work in a really cold climate. You can have a, a source for your heat, your heat units, your little uh, BTUs that are out there, either in the air, or it can be a geothermal unit, which is more efficient because below ground temperature in this area is about 55 degrees. So you're starting a much higher threshold to heat, to withdraw that heat, concentrate that heat, pump it into that. The tricky part there is that these heat pumps are not ready for baseboard hot water systems, which are also called hydronic systems. But they are ready for any house that's set up for forced hot air, and houses can be adapted to that. 
So heat pumps are, are ready, they work, and there's tremendous incentive. In Massachusetts, where I live, they will give you up to $15,000 to convert your whole house to a geothermal heat pump system. So, and, you know, maybe the cost of the system is 25. So give you $15,000 to it, what is such a system like that cost? A system like that, it depends on the location, but I think they cost normally twenty five dollars to 30000 but there's economies of scale. There's a company called Dandelion, which is owned by Alphabet, the same company that owns Google, and they're trying to introduce geothermal heat pumps in various areas, including ours, and they like to try to find clusters of houses where they can go in. So they come in with the drilling equipment or to literally drill a well, but we're not drilling for water here. We're drilling to get down below the frost line so that we can collect uh, you know, the heat. And, and they can bring this price of that system down to about $19,000. So, you know, there's ways Which to do it. Which is less than a furnace. Right. Yeah. And, and, there, and there, a lot of times, um, when you take on the loan to pay for it, um, that's a, a presumably, hopefully, a fixed rate, and so that the payment installment stays the same over the term of the, the, the loan, whereas the price of um, the price of electricity or oil or any, are all just projected to keep climbing. So where your one static payment stays the same for that heat or solar or things. <clears throat> um, then you're staying at one constant payment for the term of that loan, whereas the utilities are just only going to increase at a minimum of 5% a year. Um, and so that usually that's how, um, at least that's how it was described to me for my solar panels, um, was that, you know, as John was saying, I'm, uh, we're making as much as we need, um, and our payment for that loan stays the same, whereas the electric bill keeps going up. But the fact is that there's things that the individual can do that affects the systemic problem that you're alluding to. <laughs> and that was the next topic that we wanted to get into. That's as what I'd well, like to see happen. Thank you. Get there, it's the okay. next thing that we wanted to get into, but we want to translate into what we can do ourselves because we don't all control the political process. And if we did, we would have solved this 25 years ago. But here we are. So how can we influence the systemic problem that you're describing? Well, one of the key ways that individuals can influence that systemic problem, including less consumerism, which is, you know, you know that's, that's the kind of craving that is the root of the problem as far as Buddha is concerned, right? Um, the fact of the matter is that all of us have a bank account, or most of us have a bank account, a credit card, we have insurance, and maybe we're lucky enough to have a retirement account or some kind of thing like that. Where that money is placed and what is happening with it has profound effects on this system that we're trying to change. So I break in here and just comment that ethical funds mutual funds or ethical selection systems have a tendency to do better than the general market indices. Correct. Right. Correct. So not only are you doing better for the planet, but you're making money while you're at it. Well, you're, you're, you're supporting the yeah, more ethical. <laughs> okay. right. or more. Ethical. Whether, whether, whether you gain or not should not be the point. No, but I'm saying it's even more attractive. I mean, well, but it's it's money is your what you're getting at is it's that it's that it's a it's a win win. It's not like yeah, you're yeah, making yeah. you're not making you're a not huge you're not losing anything by going this actually. Right. right, you're not you're not sacrificing your yeah, <laughs> sacrificing your days. Yeah, not at all. So actually, for that, we wanted to bring up. I think you have a slide. Um, <laughs> we wanted to bring up the. Uh, oh. We wanted to bring up the divestment resources, right? Yeah, so if you uh, stop the screen share really quickly, could. and then uh, start it again with that uh, with that browser window, uh, far right on the bottom. Okay, what we're looking at now to is a website that has actually been produced locally uh, by our Green Faith Circle in this area. Green Faith is an international organization 
interfaith groups that are working for green energy, climate change, stop deforestation. They have a 10 point program that be hard to be opposed to, let's put it that way. And those of you who might have participated with us when we had the walk across the Mahican Tuck in October, that was the first organized event by this group of organizers who have now gone on to join officially the Green Faith Movement. And we've created what's called the Rivers and Mountains Green Faith Circle for the Upper Hudson Valley and the Berkshires. And this is from the website of the Rivers and Mountains Green Faith Circle. And this particular page is the efforts of somebody that many of us know, will say our own Michael Richardson, who put this together. He's done a fantastic job of putting all of these tools for individual divestment in one place where you can go in there and click on these links and you can get tons of information. What banks are socially responsible? What credit cards are socially responsible? How to go about doing it. He's done a fantastic job here. And so we want to just bring this to your attention. This is one of the resources that's listed and the link to this page is, is on our uh, links page. But here you see under personal banking, if you go on the right hand side where it says how to see what your bank interest in, mighty deposits guide in there, go down below, yeah. You can do a search under mighty, so take the mighty deposit search. Yeah. And, and here you can look up any bank and you can find out where they're putting their money and they rate the banks, it's a, it's a wonderful tool. And basically what we're talking about is moving money away from things like well, Citibank, right. Bank of America, the big five and all the rest of them yeah. who are taking your money and investing it in these uh, fossil fuel uh, pipelines and what have you. So the idea is to align your money with your values. And so here we can do this. You can just get a different bank account. You can open a bank with, uh, you know, a community bank or a credit union, some place where they invest the money in the in the place where you live. Uh, actually, Berkshire Bank is highly rated as one of, as, and as a bank that's in this area, and there's plenty of others too. So, just to give you an idea, so that's something you can do. Then, if you go back to the where where we came from here, if you go and then go down to credit cards, again credit cards from, you know, Wells Fargo, Capital One, whatever, these people are funding the development of fossil fuels at a time when we have to start transitioning away. Of all of these credit cards, I've looked at some of them. I have a credit card with a credit union, but the First National Bank of Omaha, which if you go down a little bit yeah. further, Koshin, below the evergreen one, that they pay, they have a rewards program they, you know, it's no fossil fuel investments. It's like there's nothing bad about the way they offer these credit cards. Even some of the commercial uh, community banks can still have credit cards that are actually sponsored by Citibank or something like that. So you have to look into that one. But there again, you can be using a credit card that is actually using your money and your, and, and your credit or what have you, the business that you're giving them to advance things that you care about. Go down a little further, Koshin, please. Same thing with home and auto insurance. Right now, there's a big movement in the uh, climate, amongst climate activists, to, to actually try to move these companies away from investing in fossil fuels. And part of that is because the political process has been stalemated. We're not going anywhere. It's a total logjam. But if we take our money and move it into places where it's acceptable, we make a statement. And when we do this collectively, it's a big statement. I read recently, I think this number is correct, that something like $40 trillion has been committed to divestment of fossil fuels. This is a huge amount of money. And, uh, you know, we're seeing endowments of, of, of universities moving away from fossil fuels. We're seeing even things like the Rockefeller Fund, which was started with standard oil money for the Rockefeller family, they've moved away from fossil fuel investment. A lot of the fiduciaries who are controlling these assets, as David has said, are doing it not just for ethical reasons. Sometimes they're not doing it for ethical reasons at all. They're doing it because these are better investments. 
So again, this is like, you know, the solar panels on your house or the solar farm. This is all a win-win kind of a situation. So, and then if you keep going down there, you get into retirement investments. Here's where, you know, it's a, it, it takes a little bit more work here, but there's, there are financial advisors who work strictly uh, in sustainable investing. Uh, there's one in Rhinebeck called JSA Sustainable Wealth Management. Uh, Berkshire Bank has just started a socially responsible uh, investment program. And if you go into that, see where it says fossil free funds. Uh, I'm sorry, under Green America, if you go down and click under steps to divest and then scroll down for me, please. Oh, okay. Somewhere is on this site, it's a list of all the financial, uh, all the financial advisors who will work with you, uh, who, you know, are working on sustainable investment. Even investing. traditional, traditional uh, you know, retirement funds like TIA and CREF have always had socially responsible fund That's options. That's true. True enough. So there again, and then on the right where you see fossil free funds, if you see, click on search tool, but just above that, yeah. Here, this is a website where you can put in the symbol of any uh, mutual fund or ETF, and it'll tell you how much they're invested in fossil fuels, and they give them ratings. You can click on top rated funds, and it'll give you the, the yeah, just there's there's their favorite funds for, for the top rated funds. Uh, they're not giving investment advice; they're just telling telling you what funds are the best ones in terms of fossil fuel investment. So there, this page is just a wonderful page for all these tools. And it's just there in one place and you can click to everything and you can figure out everything on your own or get help from somebody. So this is in answering what Wynn was talking about. This is putting pressure and leverage where it really might make the most sense at this particular point in time, because where the money goes is where everything seems to go these days. And collectively our money amounts to a great deal. And uh, Bill McKibben, again, has started a group called Third Act, which is for people in our older generation here. That's why they call it the Third Act. They say we're the folks who have the dough now that we're older. If we all divest collectively, we're going to get somebody's attention. And they're doing shareholder uh, you know, meetings now where they're asking for a, a, you know, accountability on what the plan is for climate and what the goals are and how the companies, the various companies are going to bring these things into alignment. So while the Senate is a place where good legislation goes to die, we have, we still have a place where we can have an effect. And that's why we wanted to focus on that tonight. There's all kinds of other things on this list of uh, resources that I encourage you to look at. Some of them are just really good educationally. Um, one thing that I wanted to just point out, there's, there's a, a Buddhist declaration on climate change worth a read. The uh, Dharma Teachers Collaborative Statement about climate disruption, also worth reading. We got a link here to the IPC report, IPCC. We have a link to the Haudenosaunee Thanksgiving Address. The six nations that are from this area, every time they get together, they give a Thanksgiving address to the natural world. That's worth a read. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And then also I put on here the, the Climate in You podcast. This is really a wonderful podcast, very easy to listen to. It's put together by Domi Oberg, who herself is a Soto Zen priest. And she, and she also was a monastic for many years. <coughs> and she's a climate activist. She also has a background in wildlife biology. And this particular, she, has a, she also has a podcast about Buddhism called Sand Studies Podcast. But this one is a more secular approach to just the climate. And I uh, specifically mentioned one of her episodes where she gives a very poignant and eloquent description of what happened in the area where she lives, Portland, Oregon, during the heat dome last summer. She's a really good writer and speaker. And to listen to that gives you a real sense of what is coming. And as I said before, we haven't really experienced this so much, but when you read and hear what's going on in a place like Portland, which is just, you know, another Northern temperate forested area, 
and what happened in just a few days there, it really gives you a sense of urgency of what we have to do. There is that sense of despair that can come from, from all of this. And I would say again, that the antidote to that is to do something. That's where you can start to feel some hope. And uh, beyond all that, with their citizen participation, we need our democracy to work. The government is gonna help us. We can't wait for that. So there's organizations that you can participate in, including our Green Faith Circle here locally. And uh, so I encourage you to look at all of these things. And I think like one of the things that's the most important is this is a list of resources to sort of get your mind going about like some of the things that, you know, I know some people already do like all of this stuff. Like everything on the resource list is probably like old hat to you. And then there are people like me who I'm pretty clueless. So I'm like really glad that I have resources like John and other Sangha members who like teach me about things like this because it sort of changed my perspective on like, I want to get involved in some more stuff like this. Like for instance, I'm very interested in divestment because I probably shouldn't admit this on a video where people will see me <laughs> elsewhere. But I mean, my financial life is a total mess. And so like, I would like part of the, part of the resolution of that to actually be changing, changing how I'm, how I'm using money and like being able to use a change in that relationship in a way that actually puts leverage in a direction where it stops being so incentivized to invest in things that are actively destroying the planet for for the people who are coming after us. But I mean, even right now, I mean, where I grew up, uh, we started having earthquakes when I was in my 20s. Yeah, yeah. it's from wastewater disposal, from fracking operations. And I think the state still denies it. But I mean, that's profitable. And banks are, banks are funding that. Like, our money, people like me, who had investments, like, my money is funding the earthquakes that are like destroying my mom's house, right? Yeah, but it's really good that a lot of the divide, the divestment pressure is coming from younger people. Mm -hmm. The universities, exactly. they mm -hmm. are the ones, and they better do it because they're the mm -hmm. ones who are getting stuck with it. Absolutely. And, I, and I think going back to the purpose of the CFAB was, was um, that <laughs> um, one of the priests who earmarked us as, as being a part of the pilot study was really looking at and trusting that Buddhist institutions were a, a great place to start a lot of this um, ecological change. And so that's how the program got started was if we can look at an institutional level um, for these groups that then on an individual level, those people's lives are impacted and, um, and the, those impacts can have rippling effects but it starts with the, the sanghas um, working together to do that. Um, and so uh, it was very interesting that, that more than any other religious institution that they, they've, been, they've chosen Buddhist uh, organizations across the world as a starting point for that kind of study um, and looking at how does a group come together to make fundamental change on a much grander scale than just the individual because we are in this together. Um, thank you. It's, oh, thank it was you. very informative. But you know what I just want to say? Um, uh, my husband, we were, we were, we did one of those, um, um, uh, I think it was called Clean Choice Energy, where we can, you know, sign up for the green energy. And my uh, utility bill was not quite, but almost, twice as high as it normally was it was it got to be so expensive that i canceled my membership that i'm you know i'm willing to pay extra but i i don't know i i think you you've got i don't know how you figure out um which companies are you know going to um not give you the run around but it uh, anyway the one i was in was clean choice and it was that was my experience. Like I say, not quite twice as much, but almost. You should be able to find out what the premium would be that you are going to be charged. And by the way, like in my case, I have a, a 
mine is with a, a, a nonprofit organization yeah, in Massachusetts. And, yeah. and so the extra amount that I pay every year is considered a charitable contribution. Wow. Mm -hmm. So, you know, look for something like that where you live. There mm -hmm. might be something like yeah. that. Yeah. Well, then when I tried to cancel it, then they tried to uh, get me to stay there by saying, okay, well, you can pay this. You know, they were willing to reduce it, you know, it was actually quite substantially. And I said to myself, wait a second, if they can do this, why, why aren't they doing it? I just got rid of that, you know. Well, maybe I, they have different mixes where one is 100% renewable and one is 50% renewable. Yeah, whatever. But, but yes, you have, to, you have to shop, you know, it's buyer beware as always, you know. Yeah. And there, some of these companies are out there just, they're making money and that's what they're doing. So you have to yeah, but I'm them. saying it's complicated because, you know, I'm, I'm not a stupid person, but, you know, it was just so hard to figure out, you know, what, as you say, you had to shop around and I, I don't know why it has to be so complicated. Because we don't have a public service government mm -hmm. in yeah, our right. nation. And this is something the government should be behind and making happen. This That's is the true. problem. There's but, no, there, there really has. True, true, absolutely true. But we can also rely on each other. So like John pooling all these resources or the website, yeah. provided, well, we, we can have access. Yeah. It's very helpful, but, yeah. I, but when you don't have a government that is public service oriented, mm -hmm. you're really on your own. Well, that's and, why I feel that we, I, we have two tracks that we have to pursue simultaneously. We have to try to get our government to be responsive. We just have to keep doing that. But while we're waiting for that, we have to move forward. So we only have seven and a half years to really get things changed. And so that's why these other issues come up, these other ways of dealing with it come up, divestment. The other one that we haven't spoken about is food choices. This is a very emotional thing, and you don't have to become a vegan or anything like that. But even if you're reducing the amount of animal products you eat, you can make a huge impact because agriculture is a huge part of the carbon footprint of the nation. When you go to these climate marches, all the young people, a lot of them have signs up about veganism because they, they see that as a part of the answer. And we've uh, included here, uh, you know, a couple of uh, links there, including uh, links to recipes. <laughs> But just recently, just within the last week or two, there was an article in the Washington Post about how Americans' consumption of beef is helping to drive the deforestation of the Amazon. Oh, yeah. So, you know, it, there, all of these things are connected. Or soybean, for that matter. Or yeah. soybean. Yeah. It doesn't have to be just beef. But, but, but you know, these all things. So, it, it, yes, you're right. It requires a great deal more uh, granular knowledge of what's going on but at this point you know we can do that we can we can make some choices and we can and nobody's looking to be perfect i'm not a saint uh you know i still have things i need to improve we all do but we can find things that we can do and it can help and it can help with our inspiration to go forward which is also a key and part of this because it's very easy to get to the point where you just want to give up because the science is telling us we're moving in the wrong direction. But that's not right. And I think that one of the nice things about the green faith approach to this is why I've kind of come around to that as an activist now at this point in my life. These are moral choices. If we don't, if we're unwilling to inconvenience ourselves to the point where we're throwing these problems on the next generation and the generation after that, that's it's immoral. We're not, we're not being fair to the generations that are still coming. We're not being fair if our lifestyle is making people, uh, you know, not able to survive a drought in Africa or something. These are the countries that were least involved in these greenhouse gases to begin with, and they're the first to be affected. So there is that moral, ethical underpinning to the whole thing. And again, I don't think anyone is asking we're just looking for changes that we can all see. And there's plenty of options out there. That's what we're saying. And I'm sorry to cut it short right here. We're actually hitting uh, seven o'clock right now. So everybody needs to go out to the, uh, to the Hondo. But 
I really do appreciate like all the people yes. who, who yeah. share. I mean, I I actually learned some things about people in the room that I didn't know. So you know. thanks, thanks so much. Well, good evening again, everyone. Um, so. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> I was trying to think about what to even give a Dharma talk about. Um, well, I was thinking that last weekend I was talking to a person who's sort of a friend, maybe more of an acquaintance, and he asked me if I could explain what the Lotus Sutra was about. And I was kind of, I was going to give a pretty stock answer of, um, uh, well, you know, the first half is about upaya, skillful means. The second half is sort of more about Buddha nature. There are all these predictions of Buddhahood, um, Ekayana, like those kinds of things. But instead, I said, huh, good question. And then I realized what I'd said, and I didn't really have a good way to backpedal from it. But the more I thought about it, I started to understand why that was my answer. and. I think part of the problem is that many sutras, many texts that we look at have just like one message that's pretty clear. And we can say that the Lotus Sutra has a couple of messages that are pretty clear from reading interpretations of them. But there's one verse that sort of, it, it always comes back to me. Um, it was a chapter that I really liked a lot, chapter 10. And this is right after everyone has gotten uh, these predictions of Buddhahood. You know, everybody in this huge audience uh, Everyone, including the reader of the text, is going to become a Buddha at some point. We're all in the Bodhisattva path. And this is sort of our origin story as like future Buddhas, right? And toward the end of that section, there's chapter 10 uh, called the uh, Teachers of the Dharma, where Shakyamuni, the historical Buddha, is addressing the medicine king Bodhisattva, one of the great celestial Bodhisattvas. And he starts giving him advice, right? Because one of the, the framing devices of the sutra itself is that Shakyamuni Buddha is extremely old and his life is going to end soon. And he's sort of gathering everyone around to give them some teachings before, before he goes. And a lot of people are concerned. It's not as late as the Mahaparinirvana Sutra, but directly before it. And uh, so he's kind of giving some advice, right? About like, he's told everybody that they're bodhisattvas now, but then like, okay, so where do we go from here? And in the section, his advice is that what people should do is enter the abode of the Tathagata, put on the robe of the Tathagata, and sit on the seat of the Tathagata. And that was something that I, I read it before, and I felt like it was saying, like, you know, it's about personal responsibility, right? Like, if we have this sort of nature in ourselves, and the historical Buddha passes from the world, it's like, well, it's up to us now to learn, do our best, to try to help other people as much as we can. And I mean, that was kind of how I read it for several years, but the more that I thought about it, my, my perspective has kind of changed. I think that instead of being about personal responsibility, it's actually telling us something about ourselves, about ourselves together, which is that no matter how hard we try, None of us can really assimilate and be like someone else. We each have some sort of thing that makes us different. And that functioning together, for the most part, I mean, not being too unreasonable, we actually enhance each other's ability to live in the world. I learned so many things from the members of this Sangha, and they aren't necessarily things that are directly about Buddhism. Uh, I've honestly felt so relieved sometimes just to have somebody say, oh, how can I help with this? Or pushing in a chair, or doing something simple that doesn't really seem like a big deal. And for one person on their own, does this feel like it's, you know, something as dramatic as entering the abode of the Tathagata, putting on the Tathagata's robe, sitting on the seat of the Tathagata? Like, do you feel like that's, oh, I've stepped into the Buddha's shoes right now? I wouldn't say so, but in the next paragraph, it's sort of revealed that this is a metaphor, right? That the abode of the Tathagata is a great compassionate heart for all living beings. It's our concern for other people. That's, that's the place where we live. That's the place that we're going to. But not only other people, for everyone. Your pets that you love, uh, 
I see, I see Keenan's uh, Keenan's puppy dog. Um, but even even like for those who like to garden, the plants that you take care of, all of these things, even your possessions, just like taking care of them, giving them to somebody else. The robe of the Tathagata is a flexible and forbearing mind, which, again, like, I mean, this is sort of the attitude that we come into getting to know each other with. I mean, sometimes people are really abrasive, but you love them anyway. And part of it is that we have to understand that we're also in the same boat sometimes, that we all do that, and that each of us, we have a role to play. Sometimes I'm going to be the irascible one, and sometimes it's going to be you, right? Hopefully it levels out over time, but we have a relationship to each other and how I act affects you and how you act affects me. The seed of the Tathagata is the emptiness of all things, which of course I feel like we talk about Shunyata all the time, so uh, I probably won't belabor that point too much. But to think that when we have a compassionate heart for all living beings, when we have a flexible and forbearing mind that's able to adapt to our encounters with other people, and then at the end of the day, when those two things are hard to maintain, we have that grounding that we can understand that that's an impermanent situation, that it's something that's part of a huge causal chain, that maybe we can't control the entire situation ourselves, but the situation is evolving, we're a part of it, and it's only going to be here for a brief time. And that can sort of bring us back to being able to achieve the first two, right? I find it interesting that this is like the piece of advice that's given. There are some other times where other advice is given in the sutra about what to do after the historical Buddha passes, but I find it interesting because if we all have something about us that makes us, makes us special, makes us unique, makes us different from other people, really the only way for anyone to see that is our relationships to each other, right? That's, that's how we can see what's different about each person and also how we fit together as a group and as a community and as a world. The verse that I picked for the, um, picked for the Vipassana is actually from a much later chapter in the Sutra because it goes on long after this advice is given. And uh, originally the Sutra ended a lot earlier. I wanted to share the context of that verse, right? Therefore, after the passing of the Tathagata, you should single-mindedly receive, embrace, read, recite, expound, copy, and practice it, the Lotus Sutra is taught. And I think that the Lotus Sutra is not the text in this sense. It's that sort of, that thing in all of us, right? That part of us that relates to each other. And I think that that's really like the core of what the Lotus symbolizes, right? In every land where it's received, embraced, read, recited, expounded, copied, or practiced as taught, and in every place where a volume of the sutra is present, whether in a garden, in a grove, under a tree, in a monastery, in a layperson's house, in a palace, on a mountain, in a valley, or in the wilderness, you should erect a stupa to pay homage to it. Why is this? Let it be known that this place is indeed the place of the way. Here the Buddhas attain supreme perfect awakening. Here the Buddhas roll the Dharma wheel, and here the Buddhas enter Parinirvana. And I think that this is, I love this section of the sutra because the way that I hear and understand it is that every time that we interact with each other is an opportunity for us to be, be able to experience, right? the supreme perfect awakening. We read in the same sutra that only a Buddha together with a Buddha can fathom the ultimate reality of all things. It can't be done on your own. It's yourself and other people together. And that's where we have that moment, right? That's where the Dharma wheel rolls. That's where we experience that supreme perfect awakening. And it may only be for a moment. That's with the help of each other. Anyway, this is uh, an excerpt from the uh, Thanksgiving address that uh, John had mentioned earlier. 
and the full version is in that uh, resource list that was in the email for the Zoom invite. And it says, we are all thankful to our mother, the earth, for she gives us all that we need for life. She supports our feet as we walk about upon her. It gives us joy that she continues to care for us as she has from the beginning of time. To our mother, we send greetings and thanks. Now our minds are one.